Someone make it make sense. Probably a couple. Welcome, Squirrel friends of the world, old and new. We are here today with the latest update out of Idaho, this time Fremont County, following the Chad Daybell case here. So we do have an order. This was filed on June 14th, 2024. So let's go ahead and jump right on in. In the District Court of the 7th Judicial District of the State of Idaho, in and for the County of Fremont, State of Idaho, Plaintiff versus Chad Guy Daybell, the defendant. All right, we have an order here temporarily denying access to exhibits and order temporarily maintaining status of sealed documents. On May 30th, 2024, following the presentation of evidence by the state and defense, a jury returned a verdict finding Daybell guilty of all charges in the amended indictment. On June 1st, 2024, a jury returned a special verdict to impose the death penalty on defendant Daybell. On June 3rd, 2024, Daybell filed a notice of appeal to the district court. The court has carefully considered the procedural posture of this case. In addition to a direct appeal and pursuant to Idaho Code Section 19-2827, the Idaho Supreme Court will review the entire record and make specific findings as set forth in Idaho Code Section 19-2827, including the potential to affirm the sentence of death or set the sentence aside and remand the case for resentencing by a jury or trial judge. So now let's take a look at this statute, Idaho Code 19-2827. Okay, so here we are in the Idaho Rules of Criminal Procedure. This is Chapter 28, Appeals to the Supreme Court. And here we have, as referenced in the court document, 19-2827, Review of Death Sentences and Preservation of Records. Okay, so subsection A. Whenever the death penalty is imposed and upon the judgment becoming final in the trial court, the sentence shall be reviewed on the record by the Supreme Court of Idaho. So we know that with standard uh, criminal trials, right, we know that there's an appeal and, and, and we would call that the direct appeal and that would go to the appellate court. And that is on the verdict of guilty. And at that point, in the rare occasion that they find some sort of an error and the case is then remanded back to the trial court, then in that case, because that was an appeal to the verdict... Once remanded back to the trial court, the prosecution would then have the choice or the option to then retry the case. And in most cases, they, they would. But again, this is so rare that we don't see this very often. Now, with death sentence, this is different, right? Because, in other words, we always hear languaging of, of like, the, the lengthier appellate process, right? And the automatic, automatic appeals that set in once there's a death sentence, and that's one of the things that's always discussed when discussing the topic of the death sentence. This would be an example of that, and here we are seeing it in writing from the Idaho criminal procedure itself, where with a death sentence, there's an automatic appeal to the Supreme Court. So that's separate from and in addition to the direct appeal to the appellate court on the verdict of guilty. Hopefully that makes sense. The clerk of the trial court, within 10 days after receiving the transcript, shall transmit the entire record and transcript to the Supreme Court of Idaho and to the Attorney General, together with a notice prepared by the clerk and, if a jury has been weighed for sentencing, which it was not in Daybell's case, a report prepared by the trial judge setting forth the findings required by Section 19-2515, Idaho Code, and such other matters concerning the sentence imposed as may be required by the Supreme Court. The notice shall set forth the title and docket number of the case, the name of the defendant, and the name and address of his attorney or attorneys, plural, a narrative statement of the judgment, the offense, and punishment prescribed. So essentially, a synopsis, if you will, that is required to be included in this notice that is sent to the Supreme Court. The report may be in the form of a standard questionnaire, prepared and supplied by the Supreme Court of Idaho. B. The Supreme Court of Idaho shall consider the punishment, as well as any errors enumerated by way of appeal. C. With regard to the sentence, the court shall determine, one, whether the sentence of death was imposed under the influence of passion, prejudice, or any other arbitrary factor, and two, whether the evidence supports the jury's or judge's finding of a statutory aggravating circumstance from among those enumerated in section 19-2515. And if you all remember, 
We've heard a lot about the aggravating factors. We hear this in other trials as well, but in this case, it was especially relevant in regards to the death penalty. And that was what the prosecution was presenting to the jury, the aggravating factors, uh, especially during that sentencing phase of the proceedings, which was after the, the guilty verdict. They had that the sentencing and presented evidence as to the aggravating factors. And then it was the jury's job to determine if there were any other like mitigating factors that would render the sentence of a death penalty unjust, essentially. That was the languaging that they were given in their special verdict form. Okay, so then letter D, both the defendant and the state shall have the right to submit briefs within the time provided by the court and to present oral argument to the court. E, in addition to its authority regarding correction of errors, the court with regard to review of death sentences shall be authorized to one, affirm the sentence of death, or two, set the sentence aside and remand the case for resentencing by a jury or if waived by the trial judge. Now that's important because again, we have a separate appeal happening at the appellate level for the, for the, uh, for the initial verdict, right? So in this case, this is only dealing with the sentencing. So they would, the Supreme Court would have the option to affirm the sentence of death or set the sentence aside and remand the case for resentencing. So it's just dealing with the sentence alone, not the verdict of guilty versus being found not guilty, if that makes sense. So it can, they cannot determine anything regarding the guilt. They can only resentence. They, cannot, they can only either affirm the death sentence or remand it for resentencing. Okay, then letter F, the sentence review shall be in addition to direct appeal. Like I was saying before, the direct appeal, that's the one that is would be going to the appellate court. We know that has already been filed, or the notice of appeal has already been filed in this case. Um, the direct appeal, if taken, and the review and appeal shall be consolidated for consideration. And then lastly, letter G, the Supreme Court shall collect and preserve the records of all cases in which the death, in which the penalty of death was imposed from and including the year 1975. All right, so now let's go back to the court filing. Okay, so now back to the document here. Idaho Code Title 74, Chapter 1 is known as the Public Records Act. Idaho Code 74-102 establishes a right to examine and take a copy of public records of the state of Idaho unless otherwise provided by statute. See footnote 1. See Idaho Code 74-102 as referenced here. Now, they're actually here going to include part of the relevant portion of the rule itself. Idaho Code 74-104 expressly states in relevant part, records exempt from disclosure, exemptions in federal or state law, court files of judicial proceedings, office of administrative hearings, judicial counsel. One, the following records are exempt from disclosure. A, any public record exempt from disclosure by federal or state law or federal regulations to the extent specifically provided for by such law or regulation and B, Records contained in court files of judicial proceedings, and in italics here it says the disclosure of which is prohibited by or under rules adopted by the Idaho Supreme Court, but only to the extent that confidentiality is provided under such rules and any drafts or other working memoranda related to judicial decision making, provided the provisions of this subsection making records exempt from disclosure shall not apply to the extent that such records or information contained in those records are necessary for a background check on an individual that is required by federal law regulating the sale of firearms, guns, or ammunition. And then here it's, it has let us know that this emphasis was added, that the court itself added the emphasis where it's in italics here. The quote, rules adopted by the Idaho Supreme Court, end quote, are set forth in Idaho Court Administrative Rule 32, ICAR. Boy, have we read a lot about that in the Koberger documents. Oh my gosh, if anyone wants to know more about ICAR, just check over there. I will include a link to the playlist in this video's description. ICAR 32 establishes a public right to access the judicial department's declarations of law and public policy and to access records of all proceedings open to the public. Further, ICAR 32 sets forth in great detail the scope of access and establishes the manner of access that includes, but is not limited to, promoting accessibility to court records, supporting the role of the judiciary, minimizing the risk of injury to individuals, protecting individual privacy rights and interests, making effective use of court and clerk of court staff, and avoiding unduly burdening the ongoing business of the judiciary. Footnote 2. See ICAR 32A, <laughs> 1 through 11. <sighs> There's, by the way, ICAR has, I, I'm trying to remember, I counted them in that one Koberger video. It's more than 32 subsections. 32 was not the last one. 
it's a lot. ICAR has a lot of uh, rules here. And actually, 32 has a lot of subsections because I remember one of the ones they cite a lot with Cobra is subsection G, and that was not the last one. So it's a lot. So some of these are actually different from the ones we've seen in Coburg, which is funny. So, okay, we read footnote two. All right, ICAR 32D establishes that there is a presumption that court records will be subject to examination, inspection, and copying, except as set forth in paragraphs G, that's funny because I just said 32G, I and J see footnote three. And then footnote three, of course, is going to direct us to ICAR 32D and section nine. Under ICAR 32D, the Supreme Court is to provide access to records at terminals, at judicial branches, or online, as is feasible. ICAR 32D, Section 9, states, A court record that has been offered or admitted into evidence in a judicial action or that a court has considered as evidence or relied upon for purposes of deciding a motion, and then this is in bold and underlined, except that before final disposition by the trial court, access to any exhibit shall be allowed only with the permission of the custodian judge subject to any conditions set by the custodian judge and shall take place under the supervision of the office of the court clerk. After final disposition by the trial court, the custodian judge may set reasonable conditions for access to exhibits admitted or offered. The public shall not have access at any time to items of contraband or items that pose a health or safety hazard, for example, drugs, weapons, child pornography, toxic substances, or bodily fluids without permission of the custodian judge. I don't think anybody would want access to those anyway, but you never know. All right, and then here, again, it's letting us know that they added that emphasis with ICAR 32D. The court record of Fremont County case blah, blah, is voluminous. There are numerous portions of the record that are expressly exempt from public disclosure under ICAR 32G. 32G, there again. Further, the court has previously determined and ordered on several occasions as motioned for by the parties to temporarily seal certain portions of the record pursuant to ICAR I2E, the rationale being to preserve the right to a fair trial. Moreover, the court has held multiple hearings on sealing records and entered previous orders setting forth the rationale for unsealing or leaving sealed certain records, in this case, footnote four. For example, a memorandum and order from December 2nd, 2022. I love how thorough this is. This is great. The court must now consider whether at this stage the rationale of preserving a fair trial persists. The court notes here that the case has been appealed and the defendant has issued a notice of intent to seek post-conviction relief. The court, pursuant to ICAR 32 D9, does not find that, quote, final disposition, end quote, by the trial court has occurred while the case is now pending for appellate review and post-conviction proceedings. So that makes sense. So in other words, like, like he said here, just in summary of this paragraph, the court has to decide if, if the rationale of preserving a fair trial persists, and indeed the court has found that it does persist because of the appellate process and the post-conviction proceedings. In reaching this conclusion, the court relies upon the holding in State v. Pratt. So we've got some case law here. And this is from, this is from an Idaho appellate court. In Pratt, a retired district judge was assigned to preside over the defendant's trial. The judge entered a judgment of conviction and the defendant appealed. Following a remand on appeal for a new sentencing proceeding, so this case law here would be applying to the remand on appeal. So they sent it back for a new sentencing proceeding. The defendant argued that the senior judge's jurisdiction had terminated with the entry of a judgment of conviction. Interesting. That, huh. Wow. Okay. So this case law, this is not about, even though while it might seem like this is about overturning a conviction or overturning a what, that's not why, what he's citing it for. He's citing it to show whether or not uh, the initial judge's jurisdiction terminates or not. The Supreme Court of Idaho disagreed and instead held that the trial court's jurisdiction extended through, quote, final disposition. There you go. Clarifying when final disposition has been accomplished. In this case, Judge Prather was appointed to hold court in State v. Pratt, quote, for the purpose of disposing of all matters and proceedings and final disposition, end quote, of the cause. A district court's jurisdiction is completed this is the most important part right here. District court's jurisdiction is completed upon the entry of the judgment and sentence or its affirmance on appeal. So in other words, judge judge is, or sorry, wrong trial. In, in other words, Judge Boyce is done here when this case has been, the, the verdict has been affirmed on appeal. So that will be years from now. 
State v. Johnson, 75 Idaho. Okay, so we've got some more case law here. The district court's judgment of conviction and sentencing of Pratt was appealed to this court and the case remanded for the resentencing upon which Pratt filed his current appeal. A final disposition of this action has thus not been rendered. Therefore, Judge Prather's jurisdiction in this matter similarly has not ended and will not, as the terms of his appointment clearly set forth until its, quote, final disposition, end quote. And then it's also let us know again that it's put certain elements of that in italics. Emphasis added. Here, there has been no final disposition. Notably, a notice of appeal has been filed in this case, definitively establishing the defendant's intention to challenge any possible number of issues alleged to have impaired the right to a fair trial. This is laid out very, very, very clearly. I just shout out to Judge Boyce. This is beautiful. This is this explains everything very well, and it's in a very linear and logical order. I just, this is great. So in addition, on June 13th, 2024, notice of intent to file petition for post-conviction relief was filed. So that document has been filed, but has not been made public yet because it does take a couple days through the, the, you know, the e-filing system. So we've not seen that yet, but I will be on the lookout for it. And of course, when it, when it is available, I will immediately cover that as well. And it will be included in this Chad Daybell playlist. So do make sure that you have subscribed and there will be a link for this playlist, of course, in the description of the video, if I haven't mentioned that already. And there will also be a link at the end of the video too. So we will be on the lookout for that. As such, there is not yet a final disposition in this case as required under ICAR 32D to remove this court's discretion to grant or deny permission to access exhibits in this matter. Further, where the possibility of a second sentencing hearing or even a second trial exists under the court's previous determinations to temporarily seal the record under ICAR 32I to E, the court will leave the record of the case status quo and extend an order to temporarily seal all currently sealed documents, hearings, and all trial exhibits pending final disposition following post-conviction proceedings and appeal footnote five. So before we read footnote five, what this essentially is saying is everything's going to stay sealed until this case is totally done with all of the appellate uh, process and the post-conviction proceedings. So for years and years and years and years and years, however many years, basically, once everything is done, then there's the potential for certain sealed documents, hearings, and trial exhibits to become unsealed. Okay, so as I'm looking here, we have footnote five. As I'm looking at footnote five, I'm just seeing as I my eyes scroll downwards, look at this. We have Chad's wife mentioned here. Interesting, though, that it doesn't say Vallow Daybell. It just says Vallow. Um, we'll see what they have to say about her. Anyway, all right, before we get too distracted with that, here's footnote five. To be clear, the court ordered the trial of this case to be live streamed and the exhibits appropriate for public viewing were made available to a worldwide audience. Despite allegations to the contrary, this court never has nor is presently aiming to, quote, hide, end quote, or, quote, obfuscate, end quote, the record. Rather, the court's sole objective is to preserve the record and effectuate the efficient administration of justice. In addition, the record of proceedings have been made publicly available through both public accessible kiosks at all Idaho courthouses, as well as the, quote, cases of interest, end quote, website page implemented by the Idaho Supreme Court, which repositories make available all unsealed pleadings. And this is interesting because we did actually read that here earlier in the document about the, the role of these publicly accessible kiosks at Idaho courthouses. So it's interesting. So he does mention that um, they are not yet, they've not yet been rendered obsolete. All right, so let's go jump back up here. Therefore, the court declines to grant permission to access the records of CR 22-21-1623 that are not already publicly available. Accordingly, the court finds that all public requests for the court record of this case or the companion case, oh, uh, now it makes sense. Fremont County case number blah, 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 State of Idaho versus Lori Noreen Vallow, or any portion of it now pending or made while the cases are on appeal are not right for review. <laughs> That's an interesting phrase. And, oh gosh, and to both make the most effective use of court and clerk of court staff. And here he's actually like quoting from ICAR that we just read earlier in the document. And avoid unduly burdening the ongoing business of the judiciary as set forth in ICAR 32A9 and ICAR 32A11 respectively. The court directs the clerk of court to summarily deny all such requests until quote, final disposition end quote is accomplished at which time 
forming records requests may be resubmitted for consideration. Footnote six. I freaking love all these footnotes. This is amazing. All right, footnote six. Furthermore, there is a pending criminal case in the state of... <laughs> uh, right. Yes, indeed. A uh, criminal case in the state of Arizona with defendant Lori Vallow Daybell charged with crimes including murder. In considering the right of the parties in that case to seat an impartial jury, where some of the evidence in this case involves evidence that may be presented in that matter, this court finds a compelling reason to leave the relevant documents, exhibits, or materials sealed at this time. It's interesting that they mentioned that because, you know, we we should be expecting charges to come Chad's way as well out of Arizona. So, all right, so that was footnote six. So now let's jump back up here. Finally, the court will clarify that this order does not serve to preclude the appellate attorneys or a reviewing court from accessing any relevant sealed material, and all such authorized individuals are expressly permitted to access sealed portions of the record commensurate to the scope of their representation. It is so ordered. I love the finality of this. Dated this 14th day of June. Here's Judge Boyce's signature. It's a nice signature, I will have to say. I still prefer Judge Judge's signature. It's my fave. For anyone who is interested, there was also a new document out of the Brian Koberger case in Lataw County. I did cover that as well. I do have separate playlists for the different cases that I'm following here. So uh, I will include those in the description for this video as well as on the end screen in case you're interested in making sure that you don't miss anything for those. Of course, right now we are in the, well, we... I don't know if it's the beginning, the middle, or the end of the Karen Reed trial because time has become like a vortex, but we are in the Karen Reed trial. I'll just say that much. So I have a playlist for that as well. And um, I've been doing some live trial coverage as well as recaps for that case. So that's the end of this document. Let's just see if there's anything else here. Certificate of service, etc. And there's the deputy clerk's signature. That's interesting. And there you have it. And thus concludes this update out of Idaho for Chad Daybell. As always, I'll keep you guys posted when we've got something new for this case or any of the other cases that I'm following. But until then, thanks for being here. Thanks for being a squirrel. And I'll see y'all on the next video.